Big with soft hands. I never knew what that meant. <laughs> you know, like soft hands. Interesting. Here we go. How y'all doing? Ryan, you want to start off? Do you want to give an update on Isaiah, his progression from the injury, and do you expect him back this weekend? Well, Isaiah is basically day to day. Um, we, we're not quite sure when he'll be back. Uh, he just he's improving day by day, which is great. And uh, I'm loving the signs of how uh, his health is improving. Um, and then on Cassius Winston, what's the challenge of stopping him from being half court offense and pushing that ball for you? You know what? I need to be asking you that answer. You know, give me an answer of how we can stop Cassius Winston. Because, you know, he's a very elite player, um, smart point guard, does amazing things with the basketball, um, very good at ball screens on reading actions. Uh, he does a, has a great, like, patience. Great pace to his game. He can shoot the ball very well from outside. Uh, you know, I was totally shocked to be honest with you that he decided to come back for a senior year because last year he played extremely well. And yes, I wasn't in college basketball, but I had a chance to watch him a lot, especially the three games that you know, they played against Michigan last season. And I just thought that the kid played phenomenal. And he's still doing the same thing this year. Uh, Juwan, what have you seen from, from Dave and Eli in terms of initiating the offense, handling the ball for the first and half? Well, they, they're improving game by game. Um, it's nice to have three combo guards that I can go to. It's, it's nice to play all three of them at the same time, which I've shown and done that before. Um, Eli, you know, I nickname him Professor because he's you know, a very elite player, um, knows the offense in and out basketball mind, uh, ask great questions, always thinking ahead, uh, can shoot the basketball very well, uh, just just a player. Uh, David, uh, one of the toughest they get, you know, he's like a, a clone of uh, Xavier Simpson. Uh, they both are very, you know, competitive guys, tough-minded guys. Uh, David has that natural scores ability, can shoot it from the outside, uh, growing day by day with, uh, coming off ball screens and making reads off ball screens. But it's his sophomore year, you know, really it's like his first year playing consistently. I, I just see a lot of growth in data. James? You know, when you think of the Michigan-Michigan State rivalry, I guess what comes to mind? Um, I would say that they're two schools that are neighboring each other. Um, uh, yes, uh, one of them maybe dislike the other more than more than uh, it's been documented, but it's a big time rivalry. Um, it's a very competitive rivalry, but there's a lot of respect from both sides. It's, you know, I, I'm sure neither one of them want to admit it, but it is, and uh, it's a very competitive rivalry. And a lot of Big Ten coaches talk about how tough it is to win at Breslin Center. I guess what excuse you, me. A lot of coaches talk about how tough it is to win at Breslin Center. What are your memories from from playing there? Yeah, it was tough to win as a player in Breslin Center. Um, I recall playing against guys like Mike Pavlowski, uh, DJ Stevens, who's on the coaching staff. Uh, Sean Resper was one of the best uh, combo guards in Big Ten, one of the best players in the Big Ten Conference. Uh, we call uh, Matt Stenning in there. I maybe pronounced his, wrong, his, his last name the wrong way, but uh, very athletic, skilled, wing that can shoot. Um, you know, I, I remember uh, the great Judd Eco, one of the best coaches in college basketball. And I remember the time when Coach was his assistant, and who else was his assistant? Uh, there was another big time guy who became a head coach. Tom Cream. Tom Cream. There you go. Tom Cream, so they you know, they have a lot of uh, you know a lot of basketball minds that have gone through that program, either a player or a coach, and some guys that have been very successful in the Big Ten when they were competing and coaching in the Big Ten, and just look at them now today. I mean, they've done some great things. Whether it's they're working in the collegiate level, the pro level, uh, not many people know this, but I'll say it, say it now that Sean Resper and I are very good friends. So, you know, we have a great relationship, um, hung out together, 
Uh, he's worked my basketball camp in Chicago for many years, uh, but a guy that I could see at some point being a head coach in the NBA. Brent, you said JJ or Isaiah be expecting to play on Sunday? I'm not quite sure. Praying. Mr. Miyagi, said it again, baby. Uh, also, when, when you went back and watched the tape of last year's three losses, what uh, particularly jumped out to you about how Cassius handled the, the defense that was put in front of him on those losses? You can tell he was prepared um, you know, by with some of the reads that he and plays that he was able to make off of the ball screens. He did a really good job of taking care of the basketball, making plays for others as well as himself. Um, he, his patience uh, never felt like he was sped up in any kind of way. Um, there were some possessions in the game where you know, it was in our favor, and you know, things in the first, I think, first two games looked like it was headed towards uh, a victory for us, but. Some type of way, cash has found, found the way, and that's what happens when you have guys that um, figure it out, competitive, and uh, have that competitive drive and juice. You know, a lot of us in the basketball world say that it, that it factor, it, it factor. So he's one of those guys that has that it factor. Jeff, I know you asked about cashes. What jumps out when you look at Michigan State on film right now? I would say their transition, and you know, being that we're going to be playing them there in East Lansing, you know, they they run, they get out on makes and misses, and they look for pitch ahead, uh, layups, dunks, or earlier attacks uh, by their uh, their ball handlers. So, and then last but not least, I would say how well they hit the offensive glass. You know, they're guy, they're sitting like four to the offensive glass. So we really have to do a good job of boxing out to limit them second chance points. Andrew? Juan, uh, as far as rivalry games like this one, I guess, where do you stand as far as, do you feel this game is more important than any other <laughs> Big Ten game you play? Or? You already know my answer. <laughs> you know it. You know, uh, UMass Lowell is, is a very important game. I don't look at uh, Michigan State as the most important game of the season. They all are the most important game of the season. And so um, that's the best I can give you. And then with Isaiah, uh, I know you said last time you spoke, he was you know, rehabbing and resting. Is he practicing now, or where, where is he at? Well, he's at practice, and uh, he's very active in practice. Uh, being the, the leader, and being that, that vocal guy that's doing whatever he can to help the team prepare and win. Jennifer? Hey, Juwan, you had a lot of success when you were a player at Michigan State, but how do you think it kind of sticks with your team knowing that they lost three times last season in one season to their rival? You know what's going to help us on Sunday? I have one year left of eligibility. <laughs> and the number 25 jersey is coming out of retirement. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dress up for that game, and I'm going to help our guys win this game. So I am fouling with the NCAA asking for my one-year eligibility. You hear that? <laughs> I didn't mean to make it about you because I know you love those questions, but just as a as a as a, a guy who played in this rivalry, what do you think of how how much does it stick with them? You know, does it does it give you a little chip when you lose to your rival three times in one season? Well, that's a question that you can ask the players when they come, uh, because I really don't know how how they feel. I I can believe this that they didn't feel too good, and uh, it definitely you know, hurts and. It's like a thorn in your side. So as a guy who's a Michigan man and love Michigan the way I do, just seeing that where we lost three times, it was painful to watch. Uh, I recall when I was working for the Miami Heat as assistant coach, and the third time we played them, I was sitting in the weight room working out as we prepared for one of our games. And our our strength coach is a Michigan State grad, and we always had a friendly bet in every year, whether it's football, 
or, or basketball. And this year, he owes me a steak dinner and football. Now, we play them twice in basketball. So, you know, yes, um, you know, we all, we'll see what happens on Sunday. And, and I know I'm going to get a call from him or vice versa. Uh, but hopefully, you know, it's in my favor this time. You know? But, you know, there was one year like last year, I opened three steak dinners. And I got out of town right in time. <laughs> I got out of town right in time. <laughs> I'm out, go on. <laughs> Ethan? Uh, sorry, just to clarify on Isaiah, is he actively participating in practice or active like as a voice? Hey, like I said earlier, he's actively there in practice helping us and do whatever we can to help his teammates and coaches prepare for this game. Uh, and then just, uh, I guess, the other side of what Brendan asked, what stood out to you watching last year on, on how Xavier handled their defense? Xavier Simpson? Yeah. Oh, Xavier, man. I got Tom Brady on my side, man. I feel very confident uh, as far as who we have in that locker room and my leader being that guy who I can trust and believe in that's going to help lead us. Um, he's faced them many times, and you know he treats every opponent the same and respect every opponent but his preparation is like no other. Bill, um, you talked a little bit about their coaching staff earlier. I'm just curious if you've got to know Tom Mendo at all through the years or sort of what the relationship with him has been like since he took over. Very limited because you know, I've been on the professional level, coach, been work, working in co college for like well, over 30 years almost, and been very successful doing it. Um, I made sure where we had the Big Ten coaches media day and that I went and went out to him and found him so I can share with him that I did a poor job of contacting and try him and you know just welcoming myself to the Big Ten and to this area because you know like look, I don't fear anyone you know I've always said that but I do respect people and coach Tom Izzo has done a lot of great things for college basketball whether it's you know help developing young talent, getting to where they want to be as men, uh, building their skill set, or uh, giving jobs to some of his ex-players, uh, doing a lot of great stuff in the community. Um, I've heard some of that. And um, I've always admired and respect the way how he's conducted himself on a collegiate level. And, and it shows that he's passionate. He loves the game of basketball. He loves serving. And so um, I sit back and I watch each and every coach and how they operate and run their program. And uh, to his credit, he's done a good job. Josh, you posted. <clears throat> but I want the media to know this too. Now, everyone in Ann Arbor knows this. That you know, because you know, I give these nice compliments to people. I mean, I'm scared. You know, I just respect and I appreciate what what those who have done before me. And you got to give respect to those who have done before you. You got to humble yourself every now and then, eat a little humble pie. I've done that, but I'm not scared of anyone. Posted a note on Twitter, but I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on the passing of David Stern and, and why he meant so much to your generation of NBA players. Well, it, it was very devastating to hear that news uh, because, you know, I was like what some of the other guys have already put out there, whether on their social media page or to the media, about Dave, and I, I call him Dave, but um, every now and then I call him the Godfather, but David Stern was great commissioner. He's done so much for the college, excuse me, NBA basketball. Um, what It was always my dream to someday get drafted in the NBA and walk on that podium and shake his hand. Like that is a monumental moment, shaking David's third hand and then sit, standing there next to him and taking a photo. And then my second goal was to be a champion and have David Stern hand me a ring my championship ring and tell me congratulations. And I'm like, wow, like that brown orange basketball has opened up so many doors for a young kid from the south side of Chicago who many thought that would never ever leave this that south side neighborhood and have an opportunity to play basketball for whatever reason they thought. They just didn't know me that well, but that was my passion. So my achievements was to strive hard to meet David Stern. And then to get to know him and sit across from him at the table where I was one of 
the vice presidents of the executive committee for the Players Association, and now I'm sitting across the table we're negotiating the CBA. And I'm not a lawyer, right? <laughs> but I'm fighting for I feel what's right for the players, for the, the, the body. And he's fighting for the guys we work for, the owners. But I respected his position and I learned a lot from him on his passion for the game and what he, his vision was as far as where he was trying to take the game of basketball and levels where for all the other young guys who are striving to, to play in the NBA, how it's going to benefit the world, not just people here in the U.S., but the world, are going out to China, Spain, Italy, growing the game in so many ways. I'm just naming a few countries. Like, I can keep going. That was his vision. And the game has grown so much that now all these teams are billion-dollar franchises. Like, I recall the time when, who was it? Uh, the Golden State Warriors sold for 350 something million bucks to Peter, who now the, call, the, uh, the owner, I mean, yes, two owners. But look at, now the Golden State Warriors is worth over three something billion dollars, almost $4 billion. Like, David Stern had his hands in that. He was a forward thinker, uh, had a growth mindset. So yeah, like when someone passed away, we had nothing but great things to say about that individual. But everything that's been said about him is true. So I, I really respect him, I thank him. Lord rest his soul in peace. And uh, without him, I don't know where I'd be right now. Yeah, coach, I think that's gonna do it.